Thanks, Janet. Um, before I get started tonight, I just wanted to let you all know you're used to having questions at the end of the teaching to discuss in your group, and I'm not going to do that tonight. Instead, what I want you to do is um, as you listen and hear what's being taught tonight, allow God to work in your heart and think about, um, notice the things that he brings to mind. Um, it might be a question that you have, or it might be an insight, um, maybe just an observation. I know a lot of people here really like music. You might think of a song that, you, that comes to mind. Um, but whatever that is, is he, keep that in mind. And then when you do go to your discussion groups, um, be prepared to share that with your group. So I am going to teach on Get Your Warrior On, Stand Fast. Um, so today, changes swirl around us at such a, an amazing pace. And things that seemed unthinkable even just a few years ago are now commonplace. Um, it becomes more and more difficult to stand up for what is right and to speak publicly for God. I'm going to talk tonight about four things that each one of us can do that will help us to stand and to prosper even in, in an increasingly dark world. Our adversary, the devil, has a goal, and that is to steal glory from the most high God and to appropriate it to himself. He is the enemy of Yahweh and of all those who stand for God. If you will turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, we will start in verse 3, and I'm going to be reading from the REV tonight. This is Hebrews 11.3. <clears throat> by trust, we understand that the ages have been put in order by the word of God, so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are visible. I was not around at the creation, but... I understand and believe the record of it that's in God's word. In verse four, it says, by trust, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which trust he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying on the basis of his gifts. And through it, though he is dead, he still speaks. Ever since that righteous man, Abel, was murdered by his brother Cain, people who have trusted God and stood for truth have been abused and mocked by those who do not. Verses 5 through 12 talk about the trust of Enoch, of Noah, of Abraham, and Sarah. And in verse 13, it says, all these people were still living by trust when they died, not having received the promises, but they saw them from a distance and saluted them and professed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. They all died, even though the promises of everlasting life and on a restored earth did not happen in their lifetime. They still trusted God's promise. And if you will turn to verse 32 in Hebrews 11. It says, and what more shall I say? For the time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through trust conquered kingdoms, enforced righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, 
became strong in war, put to flight the foreign enemies. Women received back their dead by resurrection, but others were tortured, not accepting their release in order that they would obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and floggings, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were murdered with the sword. They went around in sheepskins and in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and hiding in caves and holes in the ground. And all these, though having obtained a good testimony because of their trust, did not receive the promise. They're still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise, but it's going to be fulfilled. So these were people who believed God and stood for what is true and right in the Old Testament. <clears throat> now let's move to the New Testament. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit was poured out, and the 12 apostles spoke in tongues. And in verse 6, it says, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying, look, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we are hearing them speaking, each of us in our own language in which we were born? And in verse, and then it, it, it names all the different languages. And then in verse 12, and they were all amazed and were perplexed, saying one to another, what does this mean? Well, that's a good, honest question. But then in verse 13, but others mocking said, they're filled with sweet new wine. See, there's always going to be the mockers. Um, you know, we, we saw that in, in the Old Testament records that we read about, well, the believers from the Old Testament that we read about in Hebrews 11. They're always going to mock or, or worse. You know, within a few years of the day of Pentecost, Saul was pursuing Christians and throwing them in jail. And the early Christians enjoyed periods of persecution throughout the Roman Empire, where they were barred from certain jobs, they had their property confiscated, they were driven out of areas, and sometimes they lost their lives. Within 200 years, Christians were even killing each other over disagreements as to who Jesus Christ was. They were a threat to pagan religions in the Persian Empire, and they were persecuted there as well. The Roman Catholic Church began its inquisition against heretics in the 12th century. Those who dared to question the church authorities were arrested tortured, murdered, and as late as 1826, a Spanish school teacher was hanged by the Inquisition. Its official name changed several times, and it still exists today, under the name of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. In 1917, followers of the teachings of Karl Marx toppled the government of Russia and established a government based on his belief system. They declared that religion was the opium of the people and they began a relentless campaign against Christians, expanding their persecution 
as the Soviet empire expanded. Today, the Chinese Communist Party employs technology to control not only what people do, but what they think. Every single person is tracked and there is a social credit system given. You can have points given if you do things that are approved by the party, or you can have points taken away if they disapprove. And the higher your credit, the more you're allowed to do. The lower your credit, the less you are allowed to do, including buying and selling. Some of this same technology is used today in the United States and in Western countries by major corporations to shape people's consumer behavior. For the sake of convenience, we have given up massive amounts of information about our personal lives and our finances. Cash is quickly becoming obsolete. In the workplace, codes of conduct are being replaced by written pledges of loyalty to a way of thinking, which one must sign in order to get or keep a job. Deviating from approved thinking is met with public shaming, ridicule, loss of income, and loss of career. People are connected by a social media more than ever, yet the number of those who say they have no one that they can turn to for help if they need it is more than one in four. And that was before the pandemic. And despite all of this, it's still possible to stand fast in the liberty, the freedom, wherewith Christ has made us free. We find clues as to how in how the early church grew. Again, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, It says, and they, and this is on the day of Pentecost, or short, yeah, on the day of Pentecost, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. We have to sink deep, deep roots into God's word. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. And we will read the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 in verse 3. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, pay attention. The sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them, and others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much earth, and immediately they sprang up, and because they had no depth of earth. When the sun arose, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them, and others fell on the good ground and yielded fruit, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Anyone who has ears had better listen. Go to verse 18, verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches away that which has been sown in his heart. This is the one who was sown along the path. And the seed that was sown on the rocky places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately with joy receives it. Yet he does not have any root in himself, but is short-lived. 
When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one that was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worry of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one who was sown on the good ground, <clears throat> this is the one who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and yields some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. If you can turn please to Psalm chapter one, Psalm one. In verse 1, it says, blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the road of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in Yahweh's Torah. On his Torah, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Sink deep roots into God's word. Read it. Think about it when you read it. Listen to teachers who help you understand it. Ask God to enlighten the eyes of your understanding. Memorize it. <laughs> Remember those little cards? I know a bunch of people had them. Little cards, and they had verses of scripture written on them. I got a bunch of these. I've even made some of my own. You know, you take business cards, turn them around, and write on the back of them. You know, here's another one. I had a little book and all these verses of scripture, you know, page after page, and we just memorized them. Well, maybe it would be a good thing if you've done that, but maybe haven't looked at those particular verses in a while, pull them out and refresh yourself. And maybe it's a great time to memorize new verses too. Um, and don't just stop with a single verse. Memorize the whole section at one time. It's, it's, it can be very... Um, it's great to get deep, deep roots into the word. Sylvester Kirchmary was a Czechoslovakian Christian who was thrown in prison for his faith. But rather than languishing, he structured his days and weeks into a routine that included memorizing passages from the New Testament, which had been struggled into prison by another prisoner. He prayed, including intercessory prayers for his captors. He meditated on the scriptures. He sang songs and hymns with those who believed, and he evangelized those who did not. When released from prison, he worked with other Christians to resist the communist regime and helped organize the candle demonstration in the city of Bratislava. They gathered together in the town square, each person with an unlit candle. One person lit his candle and used it to light the candle of another, who lit the candle of another, who lit the candle of another, until the whole city was filled with light. This was the catalyst for the Velvet Revolution, which followed within a couple of years, and that freed the Czechoslovakian people. Later, Kirchmeri said, memorizing texts from the New Testament proved to be an excellent preparation for critical times and imprisonment. Sink deep roots into the word. Take time to memorize scriptures while you can. 
This testimony also illustrates the importance of fellowship and working together to love one another. The, the scriptures that he memorized, he was able to do because another believer had smuggled a New Testament into the prison. The other prisoners who believed encouraged one another by singing hymns together, and I'm sure there was prayer. And be kind. Don't judge people for their opinions. Look on them as human beings. There, there really are some pretty amazing people in the world, and they are brave and willing to stand up for truth, but not all of them are even yet Christians. Another part of fellowship is breaking bread. You know that famous last meal that Jesus had with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion? It's not the only time he ate with them. And, you know, at that, at that supper, they sang a hymn together. You know, eating together and singing together are two very powerful ways to build unity and encourage fellowship. I know some groups who get together on a weekly basis to share a meal. They sing, they study the Bible, and they pray together. Maybe you're not in a place where you know a group of believers that you can do that with, but you can find one person, one person that you can sit down and have a cup of coffee with or a glass of tea and talk about God and encourage them to pray with you. Um, you know, the Lord has placed us in a body. He knows how to help us find each other. The fourth thing that the nascent church did was prayer. Individually, with one or two others, and corporately. In Acts 12, when Peter was imprisoned by Herod, many of the believers gathered together to offer fervent prayers for him through the night. He was rescued by an angel, and he knew where to go to find the believers. In summary, many Christians today are misled into thinking that the more abundant life means having all the money you want and enjoying perfect health every moment until you die peacefully in your sleep at a ripe old age. This is really shallow thinking and it prevents us from making the effort needed to grow roots which are necessary to bear fruit even in hardships and when persecution arises. So, don't make this a program that you copy and paste without thinking into your life, but allow it to be a framework in which God can work within you to build strength into your life. We can bear much fruit if we devote ourselves to doctrine, to the teaching of the word, to fellowship, to breaking bread and prayer.